Please pray with me. Holy One, a lot happens in these human lives we live, and a lot happened in this week of Jesus' life. We celebrate the importance of him challenging the status quo, and we mourn because we are sad at the pain that it caused him. We are grateful that he showed us how to live our lives, caring for those in need, for the sick, and for everyone who needed his care. We are sad because we don't always remember that these ways are how he taught us to live. We are often sure that you have been angry at us, and yet throughout our lives and all circumstances, you have loved us and comforted us and done nothing but rejoice in our lives. We celebrate our lives lived in your presence for the trust we can place in your being. For the ways in which we know that you love us through the ways that Jesus loved those around him. For the ways he carried on telling the stories of your liberation power. For the ways that he loved in the face of betrayal. For the ways that even in the face of his own death he sang songs of praise and comforted his friends and followers. We are grateful. As we face this week, we remember the ways that Jesus was betrayed by friends, arrested by, and executed by the Roman Empire. We remember, too, that the story includes how it is that he lived and taught and loved the people around him his entire life. We also remember that the story of this week does not end on the cross, but with an empty tomb. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. From Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 21. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, the disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go into the city. Go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And whenever, wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where my, I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs furnished and ready make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went into the city and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and, saying, and to say to him one after the other, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes it is, as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. In Mark's Gospel, the story of Jesus' last Passover with his disciples begins on the day that the Passover lamb was killed for the meal they ate together. On that day, his disciples prepared the place that they would gather to celebrate the feast, the meal that remembered God's liberation of the Jewish people from slavery in Egypt. A meal that is still celebrated in much more elaborate ways to remember that God's intention is that they, the Jewish people in particular, and all people should be free from oppression. At that meal, though Jesus understood, knew that someone had betrayed him, he shared that meal with all of them, with his friends and his followers anyway. He doesn't go through and reject the one or the ones, as it turns out, who were going to betray and deny him, but continues to eat with all who gathered. In this gospel, he expresses his sorrow and that those who betray him will suffer their own woe or sorrow. But they are not rejected from that meal, from that table, or from the next moments of his life. 
not by him. Verses 22 through 25. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and all of them drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When Jesus established the meal that we call the Lord's Supper or sometimes communion or Eucharist, which means Thanksgiving, he took some of the elements on the table that night and made something new. He didn't replace Passover. He created a ceremony and remembrance and promise for his friends and followers. He broke the bread, symbol, symbol of how his body would be broken, and poured the wine for them as a symbol of the spilling of his life. In this way, each time they broke bread and poured the wine, they would not, could not help but remember. We too remember as we break the bread and drink the cup on Sunday mornings. We also can remember whenever we eat and celebrate together the love that we share. We remember this meal as we help to make sure people who need food get what they need, sort of creating a table, gathering everyone in. And we show our gratitude, giving thanks like Jesus did when we share the abundance of food in this world with folks who cannot necessarily earn enough to buy it for themselves. And though we set aside particular days and times, Sundays, other holidays to remember and celebrate the stories of Jesus' life on particular holidays like happened this week, we can also hold those stories in our lives as remembrance and to guide us and teach us to help make decisions and be grateful daily. Verses 26 through 31. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. On this day of liberation and remembrance for the Jewish people, Jesus and his friends continued their prayers and songs before going out to the Mount of Olives. I think to pray. As probably, and probably as they walked, Jesus was talking to them about the next hours of his life. He understood that as scared as he probably was in his body for the danger that he was in, as he would have threatened and uh, arrested he also understood that they would be fearful and anxious too. As an embodied human being, he couldn't help but feel that sorrow and that pain and that anxiety that the next hours of his life would bring. We know what it's like to face difficult days, even if we haven't faced quite what he did. Those hard days that are physically as well as mentally and emotionally hard to walk through. Stomachs tense, heads ache, sometimes your whole body hurts with the fear and the anxiety. He knew what he was feeling and he warned them about their own fear and anxiety and what it would do to them. 
and he used scripture, you will all become deserters. The sheep will be taken, struck, and the sheep will be scattered. Peter, who probably just voiced what they were all feeling, of course, denied that they would abandon Jesus. But their lives would be on the line, too. Of course they would run and hide. Peter had a family, too, like most of Jesus' friends and followers. Of course they would want to protect themselves from those who might arrest them or kill them. They knew what the Romans were like. They did not value the lives of those they governed and used death and torture for control. That is the moment they are in. It's a struggle to hold on to your values with the threat of torture or death hanging over. Probably pretty unfamiliar to most of us, really. Some of us might understand. It's a struggle even for most of us to talk about loving and accepting everyone when some of the people we know don't agree with that. How many of us give in to bigotry instead of standing our ground in the face of those we know? And that's not even the kind of fear that these people were facing in that moment. Verses 32 through 42. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter and James and John and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I'm deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is well willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words, and once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. If ever in a moment of scripture, the humanity and embodiment of Jesus is evident, it is in these verses as Jesus begins to bargain. Bargain with God, if at all possible, may this cup pass from me. To wonder if what is about to happen was absolutely necessary. His stress, his anxiety is evident as he expresses his frustration with Peter and James and John as they struggle to stay awake in the night. While I don't really think they understood everything that was about to happen, they still were stressed out by the night, I'm sure. And if they're like me, sometimes sleep is a response to stress. Some folks can't, some folks can't help it. To, to overwhelming emotion, sometimes the only escape is to shut yourself down. Sometimes it's easier to sleep than to experience all of the awful things that are about to happen or the things that you wonder are about to happen. And the most awful things were about to happen. It seems that their friend Judas had arrived 
and Jesus was going to be arrested and taken to Pilate to those who would take his life. Even though they didn't necessarily know what would happen next, once Pilate was involved, they knew what was going to happen next. We have the advantage of perspective. We know that the story, again, like I said in the prayer, doesn't end with the cross. We know what it means to us. We can be hopeful in the middle of the night in this story. But the disciples were just distraught, full of fear. Eventually, because they remembered his life with them, they were able to remember his voice calling their names, his arms reaching out and welcome, his hands healing the sick, his feet dancing at weddings and his feet walking to take care of those who needed him. But in that night, the loss was all that was there. And they would remember as the days moved on, as they broke bread and drank wine, as the years moved on, as they remembered their lives with him, what they learned, as they served and feasted and sometimes fasted and celebrated and mourned and loved one another, his life was real to them. They had embodied for a long time as they traveled with him, the ways in which he wanted to, them to live. In the story of Jesus that we tell from this gospel and the others, he wants us to remember not just the idea and the pretty thoughts of what his life was and the loving ways that he lived, but the ways that he practiced the fullness of his life with them, the way he rested and prayed when he was tired and the ways that he reached out and touched the people, even if they were unclean, even if they had leprosy, even if they were others who had been rejected. Sometimes, as embodied people, we can go beyond our, our uh, endurance for a little while, but eventually we reach our limits. Sometimes like Jesus' friends, we reach the end of our endurance and we crash for a while. In times when we have to endure a lot, we also need to listen to our bodies because that's who we are too. We have to listen to what we need. Jesus asked for what he needed as he went through that night. Sometimes it was a struggle for them to answer well but we need other people as he did. We need rest and prayer as he did. We need nourishment. And we need to strengthen each other in times of difficulty as Jesus strengthened others and he's, he reached out to be strengthened by them. We need to listen both to how we serve God and each other and how we take care of ourselves and our limitations. Jesus' final days took him beyond bodily endurance. His disciples, and that is all of us too, are meant to carry Jesus' teachings with us throughout our days, to carry his words certainly and also the ways that he loved everyone he met, his brothers and sisters of the Jewish faith, the Gentiles he embraced in their need, the women who wanted to be seen and often were not, the men who were struggling to extend their lives beyond what they understood, and everyone around him who was beloved of God, everyone. As we remember the stories of this week, Jesus' ride into Jerusalem and all of the other things that happen, his meal with his disciples, the crucifixion on the Friday let us remember them as a part of the entire story of his life and the teachings and understanding through him through all of those things because they are all a part of the same life. Let us remember. Amen.